Book One, Chapter One of Kipps. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Kipps by H. G. Wells. Book One, Chapter One. One. Until he was nearly arrived at manhood, it did not become clear to Kipps how it was that he had come into the care of an aunt and uncle instead of having a father and mother like other little boys. He had vague memories of a somewhere else, a dim room, a window looking down on white buildings, and of someone else who talked to forgotten people and who was his mother. He could not recall her features very distinctly, but he remembered with extreme definition a white dress she wore, with a pattern of little sprigs of flowers and little bows upon it, and a girdle of straight-wibbed white ribbon above the waist. Linked with this he knew not how, were clouded, half-obliterated recollections of scenes in which there was weeping, weeping in which he was inscrutably moved to join. Some terrible tall man with a loud voice played a part in these scenes, and either before or after them there were impressions of looking for interminable periods out of the window of railway trains in the company of these two people. He knew, though he could not remember that he had ever been told, that a certain faded, wistful face that looked at him from a plush and gilt-framed daguerreotype above the mantle of the sitting-room was the face of his mother, but that knowledge did not touch his dim memories with any elucidation. In that photograph she was a girlish figure, leaning against a photographer's style, and with all the self-conscious shrinking natural to that position. She had curly hair, and a face far younger and prettier than any other mother in his experience. She swung a Dolly Varden hat by the string, and looked with obedient, respectful eyes on the photographer gentleman who had commanded the pose. She was very slight and pretty, but the phantom mother that haunted his memory so elusively was not like that, though he could not remember how she differed. Perhaps she was older, or a little less shrinking, or it may be only dressed in a different way. It is clear she handed him over to his aunt and uncle at New Romney, with explicit directions and a certain endowment. One gathers that she had something of that fine sense of social distinctions, that subsequently played so large a part in Kipp's career. He was not to go to a common school, she provided, but to a certain seminary in Hastings that was not only a middle-class academy, with mortar boards and every evidence of a higher social tone, but also remarkably cheap. She seems to have been animated by the desire to do her best for Kipps, even at a certain sacrifice of herself, as though Kipps were in some way a superior sort of person. She sent pocket money to him from time to time, for a year or more after Hastings had begun for him, but her face he never saw in the days of his lucid memory. His aunt and uncle were already on the hill of life when first he came to them. They had married for comfort in the evening, or at any rate in the late afternoon, of their days. They were at first no more than vague figures in the background of proximate realities, such realities as familiar chairs and tables, quiet to ride and drive, the newel of the staircase, kitchen furniture, pieces of firewood, the boiler tap, old newspapers, the cat, the high street, the backyard and the flat fields that are always so near in that little town. He knew all the stones in the yard individually, the creeper in the corner, the dustbin and the mossy wall, better than many men know the faces of their wives. There was a corner under the ironing board, which, by means of a shawl, could be made, under propitious gods, a very decent cubby-house, a corner that served him for several years as the indisputable hub of the world, and the stringy places in the carpet, the knots upon the dresser, and the several corners of the rag hearthrug his uncle had made, became essential parts of his mental foundations. The shop he did not know so thoroughly. It was a forbidden region to him yet somehow he managed to know it very well. His aunt and uncle were, as it were, the immediate gods of this world, and like the gods of the world of old, occasionally descended right into it, with arbitrary injunctions and disproportionate punishments. And unhappily one rose to their Olympian levels at meals. Then one had to say one's grace, 
hold one's spoon and fork in mad, unnatural ways called properly, and refrain from eating even nice sweet things too fast. If he gobbled, there was trouble, and at the slightest abandon with knife, fork and spoon, his aunt rucked his knuckles, albeit his uncle always finished up his gravy with his knife. Sometimes, moreover, his uncle would come, pipe in hand, out of a sedentary remoteness in the most disconcerting way, when a little boy was doing the most natural and attractive things with, "'Drat and drab it, that young rascal! What's he a-doing o' now?' and his aunt would appear at door or window to interrupt interesting conversation with children who were upon unknown grounds considered low and undesirable, and call him in. The pleasantest little noises, however softly you did them, drumming on tea trays, trumpeting your fists, whistling on keys, ringing chimes with a couple of pails, or playing tunes on the window panes, brought down the gods in anger. Yet what noise is fainter than your finger on the window, gently done? Sometimes, however, these gods gave him broken toys out of the shop, and then one loved them better, for the shop they kept was, among other things, a toy shop. The other things included books to read and books to give away and local photographs. It had some pretensions to be a china shop, and the fasier spoke of glass. It was also a stationer's shop with a touch of haberdashery, and in the windows and odd corners were mats and terracotta dishes and milking stools for painting, and there was a hint of picture frames and fire screens and fishing tackle and air guns and bathing suits and tents, various things indeed, but all cruelly attractive to a small boy's fingers. Once his aunt gave him a trumpet if he would promise faithfully not to blow it, and afterwards took it away again, and his aunt made him say his catechism, and something she certainly called the colic for the day every Sunday in the year. As the two grew old as he grew up, and as his impression of them modified insensibly from year to year, it seemed to him at last that they had always been as they were when in his adolescent days his impression of things grew fixed. His aunt he thought of as always lean, rather worried looking, and prone to a certain obliquity of cap, and his uncle massive, many-chinned, and careless about his buttons. They neither visited nor received visitors. They were always very suspicious about their neighbours and other people generally. They feared the low, and they hated and despised the stuck-up, and so they kept themselves to themselves, according to the English ideal. Consequently, little Kipps had no playmates except through the sin of disobedience. By inherent nature he had a sociable disposition. When he was in the high street he made a point of saying hello to passing cyclists and he would put his tongue out at the quadling children whenever their nursemaid was not looking. And he began a friendship with Sid Pornick, the son of the haberdash next door, that, with wide intermissions, was destined to last his lifetime through. Pornick the haberdasher, I may say at once, was, according to old Kipps, a blaring jackass, he was a teetotaler, a near near hymn singing Methodist, and altogether distasteful and detrimental, he and his together, to true Kipps ideals, so far as little Kipps could gather them. This Pornick certainly possessed an enormous voice, and he annoyed old Kipps greatly by calling, You are and Siddy! up and down his house. He annoyed old Kipps by private choral services on Sunday, all his family near nearing and by mushroom culture, by behaving as though the pilaster between the two shops was common property, by making noise of hammering in the afternoon when old Kipps wanted to be quiet after his midday meal, by going up and down uncarpeted stairs in his boots, by having a black beard, by attempting to be friendly, and by all that sort of thing. In fact, he annoyed old Kipps. He annoyed him especially with his shop doormat. Old Kipps never beat his mat, preferring to let sleeping dust lie, and seeking a motive for a foolish proceeding, he held that Pornick waited until there was a suitable wind, in order that the dust disengaged in that operation might defile his neighbour's shop. These issues would frequently develop into loud and vehement quarrels, and on one occasion came so near to violence as to be subsequently described by Pornick, who read his newspaper, as a disgraceful fracas. On that occasion he certainly went into his own shop with extreme celerity. 
but it was through one of these quarrels that the friendship of little Kipps and Sid Pornick came about. The two small boys found themselves one day looking through the gate at the doctor's goats together. They exchanged a few contradictions about which goat could fight which, and then young Kipps was moved to remark that Sid's father was a blaring jackass. Sid said he wasn't, and Kipps repeated that he was, and quoted his authority. Then Sid, flying off at a tangent rather alarmingly, said he could fight young Kipps with one hand, an assertion young Kipps with a secret want of confidence denied. There were some vain repetitions, and the incident might have ended there, but happily a sporting butcher boy chanced on the controversy at this stage, and insisted upon seeing fair play. The two small boys, under his pressing encouragement, did at last button up their jackets, square, and fight an edifying drawn battle, until it seemed good to the butcher boy to go on with Mrs. Hoyler's mutton. Then, according to the directions and under his experienced stage management, they shook hands and made it up. Subsequently, a little tear-stained perhaps, but flushed with the butcher boy's approval, tough little kids, and with cold stones down their necks as he advised, they sat side by side on the grocer's gate, projecting very much behind, stanching an honourable bloodshed, and expressing respect for one another. Each had a bloody nose and a black eye, three days later they matched to a shade, neither had given in, and though this was tacit, neither wanted any more. It was an excellent beginning. After his first encounter, the attributes of their parents and their own relative value in battle never rose between them, and if anything was wanted to complete the warmth of their regard, it was found in a joint dislike of the eldest quadling. The eldest quadling lisped, had a silly sort of straw hat and a large pink face, all covered over with self-satisfaction, and he went to the national school with a green baize bag, a contemptible thing to do. They called him names and threw stones at him, and when he replied by threatenings, Look here, young Art Kipps, you better stop it! They were moved to attack and put him to flight. And after that they broke the head of Anne Pornick's doll, so that she went home weeping loudly, a wicked and endearing proceeding. Sid was whacked, but as he explained, he wore a newspaper tactically adjusted during the transaction, and really it didn't hurt him at all and Mrs. Pornick put her head out of the shop door suddenly and threatened Kipps as he passed. 2. Cavendish Academy, the school that had won the limited choice of Kipps' vanished mother, was established in a battered private house in the part of Hastings remotest from the sea. It was called an academy for young gentlemen, and many of the young gentlemen had parents in India and other unverifiable places. Others were the sons of credulous widows, anxious, as Kipps's mother had been, to get something a little superior to a board school education as cheaply as possible, and others again were sent to demonstrate the dignity of their parents and guardians, and of course there were boys from France. Its principal was a lean, long creature of indifferent digestion and temper, who proclaimed himself on a gilt-lettered board in his front area, George Garden Woodrow FSSC, letters indicating that he had paid certain guineas for a bogus diploma. A bleak whitewashed outhouse constituted his schoolroom, and the scholastic quality of its carved and worn desks and forms was enhanced by a slippery blackboard and two large yellow out-of-date maps, one of Africa and the other of Wiltshire, that he had picked up cheap at a sale. There were other maps and globes in his study, where he interviewed inquiring parents, but these his pupils never saw, and in a glass cupboard in the passage were several shillings worth of test tubes and chemicals, a tripod, a glass retort, and a damaged Bunsen burner, manifesting that the scientific laboratory mentioned in the prospectus was no idle boast. This prospectus, which was in dignified but incorrect English, laid particular stress on the sound preparation for a commercial career given in the academy, but the army, navy and civil service were glanced at in an ambiguous sentence. There was something vague in the prospectus about examinational successes, though Woodrow of course disapproved of cram, 
and a declaration that the curriculum included art, modern foreign languages, and a sound technical and scientific training. Then came insistence upon the moral well-being of the pupils, and an emphatic boast of the excellence of the religious instruction so often neglected nowadays even in schools of wide repute. "'That's bound to fetch em, Mr. Woodrow had remarked when he drew up the prospectus, and in conjunction with the mortarboards it certainly did. Attention was directed to the motherly care of Mrs. Woodrow, in reality a small, partially effaced woman, with a plaintive face and a mind above cookery, and the prospectus concluded with a phrase intentionally vague, fair unrestricted and our own milk and produce. The memories Kipps carried from that school into afterlife were set in an atmosphere of stuffiness and mental muddle, and included countless pictures of sitting on creaking forms, bored and idle, of blot licking and the taste of ink, of torn books with covers that set one's teeth on edge, of the slimy surface of the laboured slates, of furtive marble playing, whispered storytelling, and of pinches, blows, and a thousand such petty annoyances being perpetually passed on, according to the custom of the place, of standing up in class and being hit suddenly and unreasonably for imaginary misbehaviour, of Mr. Woodrow's raving days when a scarcely sane injustice prevailed, of the cold vacuity of the hour of preparation before the bread-and-butter breakfast, and of horrible headaches and queer, unprecedented internal feelings resulting from Mrs. Woodrow's motherly rather than intelligent cookery. There were dreary walks when the boys marched two by two, all dressed in the mortarboard caps that so impressed the widowed mothers. There were dismal half-holidays when the weather was wet and the spirit of evil temper and evil imagination had the pent boys to work its will on. There were unfair dishonourable fights and miserable defeats and victories. There was bullying and being bullied. A coward boy Kipps particularly afflicted until at last he was goaded to revolt by incessant persecution and smoke Kipps to tolerance with whirling fists. There were memories of sleeping three in a bed, of the dense leathery smell of the schoolroom when one returned thither after ten minutes' play, of a playground of mud and incidental sharp flints, and there was much furtive foul language. Our Sundays are our happiest days, was one of Woodrow's formulae with the inquiring parent, but Kipps was not called in evidence. They were to him terrible gaps of inanity, no work, no play, a dreary expanse of time with the mystery of church twice and plum duff in the middle. The afternoon was given up to furtive relaxations, among which torture chamber games with the less agreeable weaker boys figured. It was from the difference between this day and common days that Kipps derived his first definite conceptions of the nature of God and heaven. His instinct was to evade any closer acquaintance as long as he could. The solid work varied according to the prevailing mood of Mr. Woodrow. Sometimes that was a despondent lethargy. Copy books were distributed or sums were set or the great mystery of bookkeeping was declared in being and beneath these superficial activities lengthy conversations and interminable guessing games with marbles went on while Mr. Woodrow sat inanimate at his desk, heedless of school affairs, staring in front of him at unseen things. At times his face was utterly inane. At times it had an expression of stagnant amazement, as if he saw before his eyes with pitiless clearness the dishonour and mischief of his being. At other times the FSSC roused himself to action and would stand up a wavering class and teach it, goading it with bitter mockery and blows, through a chapter of Arne's first French course, or France and the French, or a dialogue about a traveller's washing, or the parts of an opera house. His own knowledge of French had been obtained years ago in another English private school, and he had refreshed it by occasional weeks of loafing and mean adventure in Dieppe. He would sometimes in their lessons hit upon some reminiscence of these brighter days, and then he would laugh inexplicably and repeat French phrases of an unfamiliar type. Among the commoner exercises he prescribed the learning of long passages of poetry from a poetry book, 
which he would delegate an elder boy to hear, and there was reading aloud from the Holy Bible, verse by verse, it was none of your godless schools, so that you counted the verses up to your turn, and then gave yourself to conversation. And sometimes one read from a cheap history of this land. They did, as Kipps reported, loads of catechism. Also there was much learning of geographical names and lists, and sometimes Woodrow, in an outbreak of energy, would see these names were actually found on a map. And once, just once, there was a chemistry lesson, a lesson of indescribable excitement, glass things of the strangest shape, a smell like bad eggs, something bubbling in something, a smash and stench, and Mr Woodrow saying quite distinctly, they thrashed it out in the dormitory afterwards, damn, followed by the whole school being kept in with extraordinary severities for an hour. But interspersed with the memories of this grey routine were certain patches of brilliant colour, the holidays, his holidays, which in spite of the feud between their seniors, he spent as much as possible with Sid Pornick, the son of their irascible black-bearded haberdasher next door. They seemed to be memories of a different world. There were glorious days of mucking about along the beach, the siege of unresisting Martello Towers, the incessant interest of the mystery and motion of windmills, the windy excursions with boarded feet over the yielding shingle to Dungeness Lighthouse, Sid Pornick and he, far adrift from reality, smugglers and armed men from the moment they left Great Stone behind them, wanderings in the hedgeless reedy marsh, long excursions reaching even to Hythe, where the machine guns of the Empire are forever whirling and tapping, and to Rye and Winchelsea perched like dream cities on their little hills. The sky in these memories was the blazing hemisphere of the marsh heaven in summer, or its wintry tumult of sky and sea. And there were wrecks, real wrecks. In it, near dim church, pitched high and blackened and rotting, were the ribs of a fishing smack, flung aside like an empty basket, when the sea had devoured its crew. And there was bathing all naked in the sea, bathing to one's armpits, and even trying to swim in the warm sea water, spite of his aunt's prohibition, and, with her indulgence, the rare eating of dinner from a paper parcel, miles away from home. Toke and cold ground rice pudding with plums, it used to be. There's no better food at all. And for the background, in the place of Woodrow's mean and fretting rule, were his aunt's spare but frequently quite amiable figure, Though she insisted on his repeating the English church catechism every Sunday, she had an easy way over dinners that one wanted to take abroad, and his uncle, corpulent and irascible, but sedentary and easily escaped, and freedom. The holidays were, indeed, very different from school. They were free, they were spacious, and though he never knew it in these words, they had an element of beauty. In his memory of his boyhood, they shone like strips of stained-glass window in a dreary waste of scholastic wall. They grew brighter and brighter as they grew remoter. There came a time at last, and moods, when he could look back to them with a feeling akin to tears. The last of these windows was the brightest, and instead of the kaleidoscopic effect of its predecessors, its glory was a single figure. For in the last of his holidays before the Moloch of retail trade got hold of him, Kipps made his first tentative essays at the mysterious shrine of love. Very tentative they were, for he had become a boy of subdued passions and potential rather natural affectionateness. And the object of these first stirrings of the great desire was no other than Anne Pornick, the head of whose doll he and Sid had broken long ago, and rejoiced over long ago, in the days when he had yet to learn the meaning of a heart. 3. Negotiations already on foot to make Kipps into a draper before he discovered the lights that lurked in Anne Portnick's eyes. School was over, absolutely over, and it was chiefly present to him that he was never to go to school again. It was high summer. The breaking up of school had been hilarious, and the excellent maxim last day's payday had been observed by him with a scrupulous attention to his honour. He had punched the heads of all his enemies, wrung wrists and kicked shins. He had distributed all his unfinished copy books, all his school books, his collection of marbles, and his mortarboard cap among such as loved him, and he had secretly written in obscure pages of their books, Remember Art Kipps. 
He had also split the anemic Woodrose cane, carved his own name deeply in several places about the premises, and broken the scullery window. He had told everybody so often that he was to learn to be a sea captain that he had come almost to believe the thing himself. And now he was home, and school was at an end for him for evermore. He was up before six on the day of his return, and out in the hot sunlight of the yard. He set himself to whistle a peculiarly penetrating arrangement of three notes, supposed by the boys of the Hastings Academy and himself and Sid Pornick, for no earthly reason whatever, to be the original Huron war cry. As he did this, he feigned not to be doing it, because of the hatred between his uncle and the Pornicks, but to be examining with respect and admiration a new wing of the dustbin recently erected by his uncle, a pretense that would not have deceived a nestling tomtit. Presently there came a familiar echo from the Pornick hunting ground. Then Kipps began to sing, Up past eight tra-la, in the lane behind the church, to which an unseen person answered, Half past eight it is in the lane behind the church. The tra was considered to render the sentence incomprehensible to the uninitiated. In order to conceal their operations still more securely, both parties to this duet then gave vent to a vocalisation of the Huron war cry again, and after a lingering repetition of the last and shrillest note, dispersed severally, as became boys in the enjoyment of holidays, to light the house fires for the day. Half past eight found Kipps sitting on the small sunlit gate at the top of the long lane that runs towards the sea, clashing his boots in a slow rhythm and whistling with great violence all that he knew of an excruciatingly pathetic air. There appeared along by the churchyard wall a girl in a short frock, brown-haired, quick-coloured and with dark blue eyes. She had grown so that she was a little taller than Kipps and her colour had improved. He scarcely remembered her, so changed was she since last holidays, if indeed he had seen her during his last holidays, a thing he could not clearly recollect. Some vague emotion arose at the sight of her. He stopped whistling and regarded her oddly tongue-tied. "'He can't come,' said Anne, advancing boldly. "'Not yet.' "'What, not Sid?' "'No. Father's made him dust all his boxes again.' "'What for?' "'I don't know. Father's in a stew this morning.' "'Oh.' Pause. Kipps looked at her, and then was unable to look at her again. She regarded him with interest. "'You left school?' she remarked after a pause. "'Yes.' "'So Sid.' The conversation languished. Anne put her hands on the top of the gate, and began a stationary hopping, a sort of ineffectual gymnastic experiment. "'Can you run?' she said presently. Run you any day, said Kipps. Give me a start. Where for? said Kipps. Anne considered and indicated a tree. She walked towards it and turned. Give me to here, she called. Kipps, standing now and touching the gate, smiled to express conscious superiority. Father, he said. Here? Bit more, said Kipps and then, repenting of his magnanimity, said, Off! suddenly, and so recovered his lost concession. They arrived abreast at the tree, flushed and out of breath. Ty! said Anne, throwing her hair back from her face with her hand. I won! panted Kipps. They disputed firmly, but quite politely. Run it again, then, said Kipps. I don't mind. They returned towards the gate. You don't run bad! said Kipps, temperately, expressing sincere admiration. I'm pretty good, you know. Anne sent her hair back by an expert toss of the head. You give me a start, she allowed. They became aware of Sid approaching them. You better look out, young Anne, said Sid, with that irrelevant want of sympathy usual in brothers. You've been out nearly half hour. Nothing ain't been done upstairs. Father said he didn't know where you was, but he did. He wore me a young ear. Anne prepared to go. "'How about that race?' asked Kipps. "'Law!' cried Sid, quite shocked. "'You ain't been racing her!' Anne swung herself round the end to the gate with her eyes on Kipps, and then turned away suddenly and ran off down the lane. Kipps' eyes tried to go after her and came back to Sid's. 
I gave her a lot of start, said Kipps apologetically. It wasn't a proper race. And so the subject was dismissed. But Kipps was distray for some seconds, perhaps, and the mischief had begun in him. 4. They proceeded to the question of how two accomplished Hurons might most satisfactorily spend the morning. Manifestly their line lay straight along the lane to the sea. "'There's a new wreck,' said Sid. "'And my, don't it stink just?' "'Stink? Fair made you sick. It's rotten wheat.' They fell to talking of wrecks, and so came to ironclads and wars and such-like manly matters. Halfway to the wreck, Kipps made a casual, irrelevant remark. "'Your sister ain't a bad sort,' he said off-handedly. "'I clout her a lot,' said Sidney modestly. And after a pause, the talk reverted to more suitable topics. The new wreck was full of rotting grain and stank abominably, even as Sid had said. This was excellent. They had it all to themselves. They took possession of it in force at Sid's suggestion and had speedily to defend it against enormous numbers of imaginary natives who were at last driven off by loud shots of bang-bang and vigorous thrusting and shoving of sticks. Then also at Sid's direction, they sailed with it into the midst of a combined French, German and Russian fleet, demolishing the combination unassisted, and having descended to the beach, clambered up the side and cut out their own vessel in brilliant style. They underwent a magnificent shipwreck, with vocalised thunder, and floated, waterlogged, so Sid insisted, upon an exhausted sea. These things drove Anne out of mind for a time. But at last, as they drifted without food or water upon a stagnant ocean, haggard eyes, chins between their hands, looking in vain for a sail, she came to mind again abruptly. "'It's rather nice having sisters,' remarked one perishing mariner. Sid turned round and regarded him thoughtfully. "'Not it,' he said. "'No? Not a bit of it,' he grinned confidentially. "'No too much,' he said, and afterwards get out of things he resumed his gloomy scrutiny of the hopeless horizon presently he fell spitting jerkily between his teeth as he had read was the way with such ripe manhood as choose its quid sisters he said is rot that's what sisters are girls if you like but sisters no but ain't sisters girls no said sid with unspeakable scorn and kipps answered of course i didn't mean i wasn't thinking of that "'You got a girl?' asked Sid, spitting very cleverly again. "'You don't know who my girl is, Art Kipps, I bet.' Kipps admitted his deficiency. He felt compunction. "'Who is, then?' asked Kipps, still chiefly occupied by his own poverty. "'Ah!' Kipps let a moment elapse before he did his duty. "'Tell us!' Sid eyed him and hesitated. "'Secret?' he said. "'Secret. Dying solemn?' dying solemn kipps self-concentration passed into curiosity sid administered a terrible oath sid adhered lovingly to his facts it begins with a nem he said doling it out parsimoniously m a u d he spelt with a stern eye on kipps c h a r t e r i s now, Maud Charteris was a young person of eighteen, and the daughter of the vicar of St. Bavens, besides which she had a bicycle, so that as her name unfolded, the face of Kipps lengthened with respect. "'Get out!' he gasped incredulously. "'She ain't your girl, Sid Pornick.' "'She is,' answered Sid stoutly. "'What, truth?' "'Truth!' Kipps scrutinised his face. "'Really?' Sid touched wood, whistled and repeated a binding doggerel with great solemnity. Kipps still struggled with the amazing new light on the world about him. Do you mean she knows? Sid flushed deeply and his aspect became stern and gloomy. He resumed his wistful scrutiny of the sunlit sea. I'd die for that girl, Art Kipps, he said presently. And Kipps did not press a question he felt to be ill-timed. "'I'd do anything she asked me to do,' said Sid. "'Just anything. "'If she was asked me to chuck myself into the sea.' "'He met Kipp's eye. "'I would,' he said. 
They were pensive for a space, and then Sid began to discourse in fragments on love, a theme upon which Kipps had already in a furtive way meditated a little, but which, apart from badinage, he had never yet heard talked about in the light of day. Of course, many and various aspects of life had come to light in the muffled exchange of knowledge that went on under the shadow of Woodrow, but this of sentimental love was not among them. Sid, who was a boy with an imagination, having once broached this topic, opened his heart, or at any rate a new chamber of his heart, to Kipps, and found no fault with Kipps for a lack of return. He produced a thumb novelette that had played a part in his sentimental awakening. He proffered it to Kipps, and confessed there was a character in it, a baronet, singularly like himself. This baronet was a person of volcanic passions, which he concealed beneath a demeanour of icy cynicism. The utmost expression he permitted himself was to grit his teeth, and now his attention was called to it, Kipps remarked that Sid had a habit of gritting his teeth, and indeed had had all the morning. They read for a time, and presently Sid talked again. The conception of love, Sid made evident, was compact of devotion and much spirited fighting and a touch of mystery, but through all that cloud of talk there floated before Kipps a face that was flushed and hair that was tossed aside. So they budded, sitting on the blackening old wreck in which men had lived and died, looking out to sea, talking of that other sea upon which they must presently embark. They ceased to talk, and Sid read, but Kipps, falling behind with the reading, and not wishing to admit that he read slower than Sid, whose education was of the inferior elementary school brand, lapsed into meditation. "'I would like to have a girl,' said Kipps. "'I mean just to talk to and all that.' A floating sack distracted them at last from this obscure topic. They abandoned the wreck, and followed the new interest a mile along the beach, bombarding it with stones until it came to land. They had inclined to a view that it would contain romantic mysteries, but it was simply an ill-preserved kitten, too much even for them, and at last they were drawn dinnerward, and went home hungry and pensive, side by side. 5. But Kipp's imagination had been warmed by that talk of love, and in the afternoon when he saw Anne Pornick in the high street and said, Hello, it was a different hello from that of their previous intercourse, and when they had passed they both looked back and caught each other doing so. Yes, he did want a girl badly. Afterwards he was distracted by a traction engine going through the town, and his aunt got some sprats for supper. When he was in bed, however, sentiment came upon him again in a torrent quite abruptly and abundantly, and he put his head under the pillow and whispered very softly, I love Anne Pornick, as a sort of supplementary devotion. In his subsequent dreams he ran races with Anne, and they lived in a wreck together, and always her face was flushed, and her hair about her face. They just lived in a wreck and ran races, and were very, very fond of one another, and their favourite food was rock chocolate, dates such as one buys off barrows, and sprats, fried sprats. In the morning he could hear Anne singing in the scullery next door. He listened to her for some time, and it was clear to him that he must put things before her. Towards dusk that evening they chanced on one another out by the gate by the church, but though there was much in his mind, it stopped there with a resolute shyness until he and Anne were out of breath catching cockchafers and were sitting on that gate of theirs again. Anne sat upon the gate, dark against vast masses of flaming crimson and darkling purple, and her eyes looked at Kipps from a shadowed face. There came a stillness between them, and quite abruptly he was moved to tell his love. Anne, he said, I do like you. I wish you was my girl. I say, Anne, will you be my girl? Anne made no pretense of astonishment. She weighed the proposal for a moment with her eye on Kipps. "'If you like, Artie,' she said lightly, "'I don't mind if I am.' "'All right,' said Kipps, breathless with excitement. "'Then you are.' "'All right,' said Anne. Something seemed to fall between them. They no longer looked openly at one another. "'Law!' cried Anne suddenly. "'See that one!' And jumped down and darked off for a cock. 
chafer that had boomed within a yard of her face, and with that they were girl and boy again. They avoided their new relationship painfully. They did not recur to it for several days, though they met twice. Both felt that there remained something before this great experience was to be regarded as complete, but there was an infinite diffidence about the next step. Kipps talked in fragments of all sorts of matters, telling particularly of the great things that were being done to make a man and a draper of him, how he had two new pairs of trousers and a black coat and four new shirts, and all the while his imagination was urging him to that unknown next step, and when he was alone and in the dark he became even an enterprising wooer. It became evident to him that it would be nice to take Anne by the hand. Even the decorous novelette Sid affected egged him on to that greater nearness of intimacy. Then a great idea came to him, in a paragraph called Lover's Token that he had read in a torn fragment of Titbits. It fell into the measure of his courage, a divided sixpence. He secured his aunt's best scissors, fished a sixpence out of his jejune tin money box, and jabbed his finger in a varied series of attempts to get it in half. When they met again, the sixpence was still undivided. He had not intended to mention the matter to her at that stage, but it came up spontaneously. He endeavoured to explain the theory of broken sixpences, and his unexpected failure to break one. "'But what you break it for?' said Anne. "'It's no good if it's broke.' "'It's a token,' said Kipps. "'Like?' "'Oh, you keep half and I keep half, and when we're separated you look at your half and I look at mine, see? Then we think of each other.' "'Oh,' said Anne, and appeared to assimilate this information. "'Only I can't get in half now, oh,' said Kipps. They discussed this difficulty for some time, without illumination. Then Anne had a happy thought. "'Tell you what,' she said, starting away from him abruptly and laying a hand on his arm, you let me have it, Artie. I know where father keeps his file. Kipps handed her the sixpence, and they came upon a pause. I'll easy do it, said Anne. In considering the sixpence side by side, his head had come near her cheek. Quite abruptly, he was moved to take his next step into the unknown mysteries of love. Anne, he said, and gulped at his temerity, I do love you, straight. I'd do anything for you, Anne. Really, I he would. He paused for breath. She answered nothing, but she was no doubt enjoying herself. He came yet closer to her, his shoulder touching hers. Anne, I wish you'd... He stopped. What? said Anne. Anne, let me kiss you. Things seemed to hang for a space. His tone, the drop of his courage, made the thing incredible as he spoke. Kipps was not of that bold order of words who imposed conditions. Anne perceived that she was not prepared for kissing after all. Kissing, she said, was silly, and when Kipps would have displayed a belated enterprise, she flung away from him. He essayed argument. He stood afar off, as it were, the better part of a yard, and said she might let him kiss her, and then that he didn't see what good it was for her to be his girl if he couldn't kiss her. She repeated that kissing was silly. A certain estrangement took them homeward. They arrived in the dusky high street, not exactly together and not exactly apart, but straggling. They had not kissed, but all the guilt of kissing was between them. When Kipps saw the portly contours of his uncle standing dimly in the shop doorway, his footsteps faltered, and the space between our young couple increased. Above, the window over Pornick's shop was open, and Mrs Pornick was visible, taking the air. Kipps assumed an expression of extreme innocence. He found himself face to face with his uncle's advanced outposts of waistcoat buttons. "'Where you been, my boy?' "'Been for a walk, uncle.' "'Not along the brat of Pornick's. Along who? That girl?' Indicating Anne with his pipe. "'Oh, no, uncle,' very faintly. "'Run in, my boy.' Old Kipps stood aside with an oblique glance upward, and his nephew brushed clumsily by him, and vanished out of sight of the street into the vague obscurity of the little shop. The door closed behind old Kipps with a nervous jangle of its bell, and he set himself to light the single oil lamp that illuminated his shop at nights. It was an operation requiring care and watching, or else it flared and smelt. Often it smelt after all. 
Kipps, for some reason, found the dusky little room with his aunt in it too populous for his feelings, and went upstairs. That brat of Pornick's! It seemed to him that a horrible catastrophe had occurred. He felt he had identified himself inextricably with his uncle, and cut himself off from her forever, by saying, Oh no! At supper he was so obviously depressed, that his aunt asked him if he wasn't feeling well. Under this imminent threat of medicine, he assumed an unnatural cheerfulness. He lay awake for nearly half an hour that night, groaning because things had gone all wrong, because Anne wouldn't let him kiss her, and because his uncle had called her a brat. It seemed to Kipps almost as though he himself had called her a brat. There came an interval during which Anne was altogether inaccessible. One, two, three days passed, and he did not see her. Sid he met several times. They went fishing, and twice they bathed. But though Sid lent and received back two further love stories, they talked no more of love. They kept themselves in accord, however, agreeing that the most flagrantly sentimental story was proper. Kipps was always wanting to speak of Anne, and never daring to do so. He saw her on Sunday evening going off to chapel. She was more beautiful than ever in her Sunday clothes, but she pretended not to see him, because her mother was with her. But he thought she pretended not to see him because she had given him up for ever. Brat! Who could ever be expected to forgive that? He abandoned himself to despair. He ceased even to haunt the places where she might be found. With paralysing unexpectedness came the end. Mr Salford, the draper at Folkestone to whom he was to be bound apprentice, had expressed a wish to shape the lad a bit before the autumn sale. Kipps became aware that his box was being packed and gathered the full truth of things on the evening before his departure. He became feverishly eager to see Anne just once more. He made silly and needless excuses to go out into the yard. He walked three times across the street without an excuse at all to look up at the Pornick windows. Still she was hidden. He grew desperate. It was within half an hour of his departure that he came on Sid. Hello, he said. I'm off. Business? Yes. Pause. I say, Sid, you going home? Straight now. Do you mind? Ask Anne about that. About what? She'll know. And Sid said he would. But even that, it seemed, failed to evoke Anne. At last the Folkestone bus rumbled up and he ascended. His aunt stood in the doorway to see him off. His uncle assisted with the box and portmanteau. Only furtively could he glance at the Pornick windows, and still it seemed Anne hardened her heart against him. "'Get up!' said the driver, and the hooves began to clatter. No, she would not come out, even to see him off. The bus was in motion, and old Kipps was going back into his shop. Kipps stared in front of him, assuring himself that he did not care. He heard a door slam, and instantly craned out his neck to look back. He knew that slam so well. Behold, out of the haberdasher's door, a small untidy figure in homely pink print had shot resolutely into the road and was sprinting in pursuit. In a dozen seconds, she was abreast of the bus. At the sight of her, Kipp's heart began to beat very quickly, but he made no immediate motion of recognition. Artie, she cried breathlessly, Artie, Artie, you know, I got that. The bus was already quickening its pace and leaving her behind again, when Kipps realised what that meant. He became animated, he gasped, and gathered his courage together, and mumbled an incoherent request to the driver to stop this a jiff for something. The driver grunted as the disparity of their years demanded, and then the bus had pulled up, and Anne was below. She leapt up upon the wheel. Kipps looked down into Anne's face, and it was foreshortened and resolute. He met her eyes just for one second as their hands touched. He was not a reader of eyes. Something passed quickly from hand to hand, something that the driver, alert at the corner of his eye, was not allowed to see. Kipps hadn't a word to say, and all she said was, "'I done it this morning.' It was like a blank space in which something pregnant should have been written and wasn't. Then she dropped down, and the bus moved forward. After the lapse of about ten seconds, it occurred to him to stand and wave his new bowler hat at her over the corner of the bus stop 
and to shout hoarsely, "'Good-bye, Anne! Don't forget me while I'm away!' She stood in the road looking after him, and presently she waved her hand. He remained standing unstably, his bright flushed face looking back at her, and his hair fluffing in the wind, and he waved his hat until at last the bend of the road hit her from his eyes. Then he turned about and sat down, and presently he began to put the half-sixpence he held, clenched in his hand, into his trouser pocket. He looked sideways at the driver to judge how much he had seen. Then he fell to thinking. He resolved that, come what might, when he came back to New Romney at Christmas, he would, by hook or by crook, kiss Anne. Then everything would be perfect and right, and he would be perfectly happy. End of chapter 1